But first, we explore the groundbreaking zero suicide strategy in Liverpool. This programme is presented by the author Matt Hagg, the writer of the best-selling Reasons to Stay Alive, a book that explored Matt's own struggles with depression and suicidal thinking. This is The Edge of Life. I started to feel down, down to a point where it was uncontrollable. It was so hard for me to do the simple things of getting washed, getting bathed, getting ready. And it was hard to accept because I didn't think anyone else out there was suffering the same as what I have been through. I'd hear voices in my head of telling me things that I was worthless, I was not wanted. And it was so hard for me literally waking up every day knowing that I wanted to end my life. Suicide is, is the leading cause of death for men under the age of 50. And there are over a million people estimated to take their own life every year across the world. So it's, it's a significant problem. My name is Matt Haig, and this programme is about the way in which One Healthcare Trust is changing how we talk about suicide. My partner... Basically, he treads us on eggshells. He was trying to help me, he tried hugging me. He was saying everything will be OK. And, yeah, tried to fix me, yeah. And he couldn't because at the time I didn't want to be fixed. Three quarters of deaths by suicide are, are men. A general view is that maybe men don't seek help early enough. Mental health care is terribly stigmatised, even in 2017. You know, I think the, the figures run something like if you have a physical disability, you're six times more likely to be discriminated against than an able-bodied person. If you've got a mental illness, that's something like 12 times more likely to be discriminated against. And that's one of the reasons that we have been so keen to radically rethink the way we try to help people when they're suicidal. In January of 2015, then-Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg called for an overhaul of the way in which the NHS tackled suicide. He said at the time, Suicide is, and always has been, a massive taboo in our society. In his National Suicide Prevention Strategy, Clegg called upon hospitals to aim to end all such deaths. In his words, Suicide is preventable, it is not inevitable. He wanted to see a 10% reduction in lives lost year on year. As the Samaritans say, the majority of people who feel suicidal don't actually want to die, they just don't want to live the life that they have. That distinction, it might seem slight, but it's absolutely critical if we're to save more lives. With me, I became ill when I was 24. Uh, for some people, um, depression is a very gradual, thing with me with my mental illness it was very sudden it was depression and anxiety but i didn't really have those terms in my head at the time but i just knew i was ill it was very clear clearer than anything that had happened in my life that i'd crossed over a line into a state of um serious illness i think the biggest misconception about suicide for my experience of having suicidal thoughts is that it, it wasn't really a death wish which sounds sort of paradoxical but it, it i suppose the only way the best way i can describe it is if you were um, suddenly trapped in a burning building and you jumped out the window because the, hat of the building was on fire that's not because you suddenly are fine with jumping out of windows it's because the other reality is too much to bear and that's exactly it the fear of death is exactly the same the pain of the idea of losing people and leaving people and then causing them pain that's exactly the same but, but, but what has changed the other part of the equation is that life has suddenly become literally unbearable Okay, my name's Joe Rafferty and I'm Chief Executive of Merseycare NHS Foundation Trust. We provide services for uh, people in primary care, talking therapies, those sorts of things, right through to uh, running one of the three high-secure hospitals in the NHS. 
So we serve a population of around a million people. And that covers Liverpool and sort of up the northern coast of uh, Merseyside, so north and south Sefton. Interestingly, areas that are, you know, significantly impacted by socioeconomic deprivation and uh, areas also with very high levels, a high prevalence of, of mental health conditions. Merseycare were on the cusp of rethinking the way they provided services when fate intervened. Probably three years ago at, at the Trust, we had uh, three deaths in, in one of our units. And I think it was a sort of profound and shocking moment for us. Not that any time someone had lost their lives in our services that we, we didn't feel, you know, as an organisation shocked by that. But because this happened in a short period of time, we really put our heads together and decided to think very differently about how to manage the approach the organisation was going to take to become as safe as possible for patients in, in Mersey Care. So if you looked at all of the mental health trusts across the country, I think we'd say, well, look, we're, we're still in the bottom 20%, so um, we're doing pretty well on this. But then when you convert that through to lives lost every year, you know, somewhere between maybe 20 to 30 people in our services or in contact with our services dying every year, suddenly that absolute number feels very different. So we decided as an organisation that we were going to do something really different to say that anybody who comes into our services and who's in contact with Mersey Care shouldn't die by suicide. David Fernley is a doctor and psychiatrist in Mersey Care. His main job is working as a medical director of the Trust. One of the biggest revelations to him in recent years was something called Zero Suicide, an initiative that first gained traction in the US and has been cited by Nick Clegg as a guiding example of how he felt services could be improved here in the UK. Dr Fernley had come across the Zero Suicide idea several years before. It was an approach pioneered by Dr Ed Kofi and his colleagues at the Henry Ford Medical Group in Detroit back in 2001. Kofi's first task was to reposition suicide as a wholly preventable illness. The next was to treat it with the same significance as any other life-threatening condition. Within four years, the suicide rate among Henry Ford's patient population had fallen by 75%. By 2008, they had stopped all suicides among patients of the medical group. The zero suicide phrase first came to our awareness about four or five years ago because in in Detroit um, they had adopted this approach and what they described as a perfect depression pathway. They, they, They really tried everything they could possibly do to produce excellent depression care and they saw their suicide rate fall to zero on some occasions, which was almost unheard of. We were inspired by that and invited Ed Kofi over, who was the physician involved, the psychiatrist, and he explained how they use quality improvement science, which we have available to ourselves, to think through how to achieve almost the unthinkable, which is people not dying by suicide. My name's Ed Coffey. I'm a neuropsychiatrist, and I currently serve as the president and CEO of the Menninger Clinic in Houston, Texas. I'm very delighted to be here again in Liverpool. There is a great movement afoot here that is seeking to transform the way we deliver health care. So what we're, what we're doing now is committing not to a 2% or 3% improvement in errors, let's say, but to instead a complete elimination of any errors. Uh, so medication safety now will be dramatically improved. The physical safety of our uh, patients on the the wards will be much better. There won't be any risk of falling, for example. Uh, The need for seclusion and restraints in the mental health system is going to be dramatically reduced. In in fact, Mercy Care is leading the world, in my opinion, in their efforts to uh, eliminate the need for seclusion and restraint. Their no-force-first policy and approach is really a, a benchmark for the entire country. So it's all about using this notion of pursuing perfection to transform the way we uh, provide health care and to, to change from a business-as-usual kind of a model to a, a totally different way of doing the work. In September 2015, Mersey Care Trust 
launched their own zero suicide strategy. They're working with Professor Lewis Appleby and his team at the University of Manchester to provide a sharper academic look at the project. Well, I think the findings in the United States are a little less easy to apply to the NHS. The system is very different. Uh, They've not been subject to the same kind of evaluation as you'd expect for interventions in this country. So um, I think that what we are picking up from the zero suicide um, initiative uh, is not so much the data that they are reporting, but the ambition. It's reminded us that suicide does not need to be viewed as inevitable, the kind of fatalism that sometimes makes its way into into care. Uh, So our, our view is that we should take the ambition of the Zero Suicide Initiative, but the evidence from the NHS. Merseycare's Zero Suicide Strategy has three main goals. To create a team of experts focused specifically on the needs of suicidal patients, to improve the care for service users, and to overhaul the use of patient data. Some of the things we've been doing is, first of all, to make sure that everybody in the organisation is either uh, suicide-aware trained, uh, and for those people who are in direct contact with patients, they are absolutely trained in the latest thinking and are are aware of the latest evidence. Uh, So whilst we're sort of waiting for everyone to get here, can you tell me your names and where you're from? Um, I'm uh, my name's Jane Boland and I'm the clinical lead for suicide prevention here at Merseycare NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, today, um, myself and Angela Samata are delivering our level two suicide prevention training. So that's training for people who are working in a clinical role. So we talk to people about using a simple sort of tool to understand risk. Um, And what I will be doing over the next six months with this team here at Clockview is going back and making sure that they're using it. They have to do it as as a result of coming to this training. So we're, we're trying to sort of make sure that what we're teaching here today starts being delivered to our service users. I want you to, and you've got about 10 minutes... I want you to give me a definition, think about and give me a definition of what a risk factor is and then what a protective factor is. Maybe in threes, three, 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 three. Yeah? And then at ten minutes, go on, feedback to me. There's sort of like a hopelessness about the future and things like that. It's sort of like, you know, like losing jobs and, you know, facing the future and... Of like a loss, really, a, a loss of hope. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. I'd agree with that. We, we sort of cover the, the borough of Liverpool, Sefton and a, a bit of, of Knowsley. Liverpool borough area actually has got a relatively low rate when you think about the area that it covers and the deprivation in, in Liverpool. Uh, Sefton has got one of the highest rates in, in the UK. Knowsley sort of falls halfway in between, but we still know that, that too many people are dying every year. So, so, yeah, it does feel really challenging. One of the key factors of Jane Boland's suicide prevention training is that it's developed with those who have actual personal experience. One of those people is Angela Samata. She co-produced the training that she now helps Jane deliver. She has a deeply personal motivation for sharing her knowledge. I was invited to be part of this after I made the documentary Life After Suicide that was on BBC One. And so I presented that documentary and I was also the head of the Survivors of Bereavement by Suicide Charity for a long time. And really that came from my own lived experience of losing my partner 13 years ago. He, he took his life in 2003. For Angela, the fact that the training opens up a straightforward dialogue about suicide is one of the most groundbreaking elements of it feeling okay about having a conversation with somebody saying are you feeling suicidal and knowing what to do if that person says yes well that is now mandatory across the whole of Mersey Care across the 5,000 plus staff you know everybody including you know receptionists and clinical staff and the executive team everybody now has had that training about how to have that conversation now those people all of those 5,000 individuals don't exist just in in places like we're in today clock view all of that learning is is constantly being carried with people and constantly then being passed on to other people so i think the the ambition is for everybody taxi drivers hairdressers all of the people that we tell are 
darkest secrets too sometimes you know when you talk sometimes it's easier to have the conversation with the back of a taxi driver's head isn't it than it is to kind of speak to your best friend or you or your doctor about something you know um I think for me the exciting part is how the conversations that go on in this room how can those conversations influence the wider uh, much bigger conversation that needs to go on about suicide prevention. Stephen, or Stee, as he prefers to be known, is 30. He's lived with his partner for five years. Stee loves his job. He's a support worker and takes care of the elderly. He's also a Mersey Care service user, and he's had depression for nine years. The changes being implemented by Mersey Care will impact upon him directly. I first noticed it when I was 21. Uh, my mum and dad went through a bad breakup. So I didn't know where I sort of fitted in in life then. And by the age of 25, I come out as gay. Um, I, everything was fine. I, I think it was more worrying than anything. So it was more... I took a step back the past two years. I had a bad breakdown in work. I work as a carer. Um, done it for 12 years now. And stress got on top of me. And... I wasn't sleeping, I'd spend me nights into days, days into nights, I'd spend many hours with on on a pathway of not sleeping. I withdrew from family, I'd um, wait for my partner to go to work and I'd open the curtains and as soon as he'd leave I'd draw the curtains and lay on the floor for nine hours, not being able to do nothing and it became sort of an act in life and the act in life was literally, for me, was everything's fine but then it come to the six months later where it did have another major breakdown which was different this time I knew there was something extremely wrong um, it drew me to have thought of suicide there's a really empowering voice that tells you you know, you're going to do this and I let my family know that you know, one day I am going to do it and I'm not going to be here anymore just I thought of that there was help out there and I knew there was help out there but I didn't know how to go about it Part of the problem with depression and with the suicidal thoughts is that they're all-encompassing. You don't believe that anybody else has ever felt the way that you feel. For that reason, articulating your thoughts out loud feels like a completely alien thing to do. And people still have a perception that talking out loud about suicide will somehow influence suicidal thinking. But this view is completely out of date. Dr Lewis Appleby. There was a time when people were very reluctant to talk about suicide, that sense that if I, if I ask a distressed person about suicidal thinking, maybe it'll put the idea into their mind. Uh, and of course, it's likely to be the opposite. They're likely to be relieved that somebody's recognised their distress. There's that sense that, um, that sometimes suicidal people, perhaps particularly young people who self-harm, don't really mean it, that anybody who's talking about suicide, well, they can't really... Uh, intend to do it. Where, um, you know, p- people who talk about it don't do it. Completely wrong, of course, because talking about suicide is one of the strongest predictors. When we first started our work, people quite often said to us that they didn't really feel that mental health services could make too much difference to a person's risk. And we felt dissatisfied with that approach. We felt that uh, the that that suicides are individual. That the things that put a person at risk are often they're often quite complex. People's lives are complex, and that the th- that what they need is also quite complex and quite individual. And we shouldn't simply say, well, suicide is related to unemployment, so let's wait for the unemployment rate to come down, and then we'll have a better chance. We, the, after all, if you're faced with a suicidal patient, you can't simply say, well, let's hope for an upturn in the global economy. You, you've got to try and do something to help that person on that day with their risk. And so our aim was to find out what those protective factors uh, might be. But that sense that, oh, well, there's nothing that services can really do, that that used to be quite prominent in mental health care. It was first in 2000 I had to go to my um, doctor and say about my previous suicide attempts. Um, And then he said to me, well, okay, we need to, we obviously need to get you to see a psychiatrist. And sadly he did say at the time, there's about a six month waiting list. And I I remember sitting there, but I didn't say it, thinking, I've just told you I'm suicidal and you're telling me to wait six months. Come on, please. Wayne is now 50 years old, but he was still a child when he first sensed that something was wrong in terms of his mental health. But at that point, he didn't have the words to articulate how he was feeling. 
Well, my mental health problems would probably start at around the age of 12. Um, with my first suicide attempt, probably around the age of 17. Admitting he had a significant problem wasn't easy for Wayne. But suicidal feelings have cast a shadow for decades. He's lost count of the times he's tried to take his life. But he places the number somewhere between 15 and 20. For years, I kept my mental health problems hidden. Um, If you'd have said to me, I have mental health problems, I'd have argued black and blue with you that I don't. Part of his anxiety about disclosing how he felt was the distress it would cause his parents. His younger brother had taken his own life at just 14 years old. They'd already lost one son. Wayne was worried that they'd be fearful of losing another. Um, And then in about 2009, I got really suicidal again, and it was the point where if I didn't seek help, I would have tried another suicide attempt. So I always remember it. I was working in the um, Royal Hospital at the time. I had to say to my boss, I'm not feeling well, I need to go home. And then he had to go home to my parents and admit everything. I had to tell them that I was feeling suicidal. And unless I got help, I wouldn't be able to stop myself. My dad got an emergency appointment with the doctor. Um, He saw what sort of state I was in. And then he he arranged for me to go to um, Fazakhali Hospital for an assessment. Um, After seeing the psychiatrist, he recommended that I go into Broadoak. And there was a little bit of it, we'd like you to go into Broado, but I know, now using reflection, if they'd have, if I'd have said no, they'd have said, well, you're going with section in you. So I did go in voluntarily, but again, it was a really good thing because I got some really great help in there. And it was the beginning of my recovery then. Wayne was eventually diagnosed with cyclical clinical depression. He says he's glad to put a name to his condition because at least now he knows what he's dealing with. Attitudes have started to shift. Joe Rafferty. For example, when we do a a questionnaire before the awareness training, about 70 to 80% of our staff think that suicide is a selfish act and that it's inevitable. Some level of suicide is inevitable. Then when we go through the training, which takes only about 45 minutes, it can be done online, it's relatively simple, uh, that number drops to about 10%. And that's a really big change just for 45 minutes worth of training. And if staff still feel daunted about making decisions which could potentially have fatal consequences, one part of the plan is a built-in support team. So we've got some experts in the organisation who any other professional in the organisation can ring. So if they've got a patient who they're they're a bit worried about and they don't quite feel they've got a proper grip on all of the things that they could or should be doing to have a sort of second view and a second opinion. I'm part of what's called the Safe From Suicide team, so um, I'm lucky enough to be the, the pretty much the only person who does this full time. Jane Boland. And I think I might be the only person who does this sort of stuff full time in the UK. That's been the commitment to the trust to, to this, um, to do this. Other, other organisations have somebody who's called a zero or like a suicide prevention lead, but it tends to be, you know, an add-on to another very difficult job. So they're like clinical director of nursing and suicide prevention lead. Lewis Appleby is Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Manchester. He's been working closely with the team at Mersey Care on the suicide prevention strategy. Lewis has spent 25 years in the field of suicide research. We uh, became concerned about the risk that people face when they leave hospital having been admitted for illness. So you'd think that would be a time of recovery, you'd think that would be a time when people would be optimistic and returning to their normal lives. But in fact that period after admission, when people first return home, is the time of maximum risk. So we, had, we came up with a, a whole set of factors that we felt were making a difference to risk in individual local services. Safer wards, follow-up care on discharge, supporting people who've got mental illness but also an alcohol problem, uh, supporting families, working with families, uh, the, the sense of a learning culture, services which 
when an incident occurs they work with the family to learn what happened and to improve their service as a result. that learning culture that lots of people talk about, we found evidence that it was followed by lower patient suicide rates so a set of routine things that services can do to make themselves safer. Joe Rafferty and his team have Lewis's research on board. They're now particularly vigilant about those leaving their care and their service users play a role in deciding the next best steps for them. We're now collecting data to make sure that we're putting all of the services around people in an absolutely appropriate way. So yeah, my name's Owen Winsland. I'm the ward manager on Morris Ward, which is a male acute inpatient ward on Mor- in Clockview Hospital. We start planning for someone's discharge from the moment they arrive. One of the things that patients have always said that they want is that they, they, they like to know that there's, a, there's an end. And as a trust, we sort of we work towards that. Um, we work on that principle. But yeah, it can be some patients might just come in for a crisis, in which case they're in 24 hours, they feel better, they go. There'll be other patients who come in and need a longer, longer stay the old sort of days when patients came in and it was months and months and months and months for an admission. I think we've moved away from that, certainly within general adult sort of services, uh, general mental health services. To consolidate the work going on at places like Clockview Hospital, technology will play an increasingly important role in mental health and wellbeing for the people who need it. We have been working with the Risk Authority in Stanford, California for a couple of years around bringing, bringing high-tech you know, digital thinking into our practice in Merseyside and we'll be using an app that we've developed that will give us information about people's emotional life, um, their activity, to look for patterns in that that we probably wouldn't notice in day-to-day clinical practice. The app is called SWIM, which means strength within me. And there's a similar version that will be adapted for social media streams. So we're trying to think not just what information people put into it, but actually how we can connect to social media. It feels it's a long journey, but we hope within 12 months we'll have the, the early signs that it might be helping. People will be recruited in October, so it's ready to go. We're just waiting to hit the ground running with the research. But you can imagine how different an approach that is from coming to a mental health service maybe for half an hour every three months. And in that narrow little window, we we hope that we can see everything that's going on in their lives. But imagine the difference when we widen that window to 24 hours a day. I mean, this won't happen overnight. But, you know, for me, this is going to be 21st century science brought to the application of a problem that has been with us, of course, for thousands of years, which is suicide. While technology can certainly take a bit of the pressure from those on the front lines, Dr Lewis Appleby does have some concerns about zero suicide as a proposition for staff. People in the health service are concerned about sometimes about the zero suicide message because it implies that suicide should never occur and they're worried that will turn into blame for them because somebody will say well what went wrong that a suicide did occur so there is a concern that that is a genuine concern and i would say that the best the best evidence we have has come from studies within the health service here Uh, and the message from detroit the most helpful part of it has been about um, that suicide is not inevitable and feeding that into our services which sometimes feel overwhelmed and fatalistic that is very valuable what we've said is zero suicide it's not a target because people get very nervous about that. The notion of zero makes us think differently. Three years ago, four years ago, we sort of had a a sense that, you know, having a background number of suicides was okay. But once we said zero, we've done everything we can to now minimise that number. And it's made us very inventive. I'm not really sure we'd have been in the world of artificial intelligence today if we hadn't said zero suicide. The core aim of Mersey Care suicide prevention strategy was to change the language around suicide. In a way, this has given people permission to be open about their mental health and the freedom to express themselves openly and honestly when they're going through a hard time. The My Recovery actually brought me to open up to my friends and wanting to make my friends and family aware of what had been going on as if, you know, you're going to be better tomorrow. I wasn't. It was an illness and... 
I wasn't going to be better tomorrow and I was still recovering like I say I'm still recovering now it's going to be a journey of recovery for me and I'm proud of that um, because it's so hard for people to understand who haven't suffered with the illness themselves if we could project our minds onto a wall and show everyone what was going on I think it'd take, make people step back and say hold on a minute this person really needs help and see you for who you really are it's took me to get to age 30 now and I wish I would have seen help a long time ago but what about the people who seem perfectly fine the people whose suicide to the outside world seemed to come from nowhere the trouble with the idea of a more open level of engagement only works if someone wants to engage this was certainly the case for Angela Samata Mark, my partner He didn't have um, contact with any services or agencies before he took his life. In fact, he didn't tell anybody, to the best of my knowledge, that he was feeling suicidal. Um, And I certainly didn't know, and I I spoke to him 15 minutes before I I discovered that he he died. Um, Now, what's interesting for me is the conversations that are going on around zero suicide in an inpatient setting are conversations that are now being mirrored outside of that setting. So it's... um, people like Mark, so people that we naturally think of as maybe hard to reach, the people who don't tell anybody that they're feeling suicidal. Uh, What's exciting for me is how this training, it's, I think, kind of changing a conversation and and opening up a conversation around suicide prevention that's, that's needed to happen for a long time. You know, we've now used our zero suicide awareness tool to train staff in one of the major banks. We're about to start this week with staff in one of the biggest construction companies in the country. We've trained local taxi driver firms. We're now training one of our local councils. So this thing is starting to spread, you know, and spread very, very significantly. And a small number of us, this trust and a few other people, a number of small charities have talked now about the potential to create the country's first zero suicide alliance. The one thing I've discovered since I've started talking, writing, blogging, whatever else about mental health is is just how universal it is. I knew it in the abstract. I knew statistics and numbers. But really, you can talk to anybody. And if you get to a certain level with them, it will either be them or their partner or some immediate member of their family, you know, has dealt with something very, very serious mentally, just as we know lots of people who've had um, serious physical illness. This ripple effect is particularly meaningful for Angela. By spreading the word of suicide being a preventable illness, she feels much more confident about her own future. The day that I opened that front door and I discovered that he'd taken his life was the first time that I had ever had to think about or feel anything at all to do with suicide, somebody taking their life. My boys were 3 and 13 at the time and now they're 16 and 27. Now I've sat in enough conferences and delivered at enough conferences to know that my children, by the fact that they're male, uh, the fact that their father took his life, the, the age that they are, they're under 50, and we know that suicide is the biggest killer of men under 45. My children are now in one of the highest risk groups, and I know that. And so every time I deliver that training, I'm also aware that I, you know, fingers crossed, I'm contributing to a, a conversation, a, a, te- a temperature, if you like, that means that my kids and your kids will be able to say, actually, I'm not feeling great. Dr David Fernley. Where we're making a change, we're seeing an improvement. And so we're in still the beginning phases. We're working with the University of Manchester to measure all these changes. Uh, We think this will be a few years' work, and that's what the experience in Detroit was. It took about five years, ultimately ten years. But what's been really important is the fact we've, we've decided this is what we want to do. For anybody who decides not to end their life as a result of this, that will be success. Wayne is still vigilant about his mental health. He's aware of his risk factors... And he also knows the steps that he can take to keep himself well. One of those things is being in work. Alongside being a Merseycare service user, Wayne also works for the Trust as a peer support worker. He leads group sessions with his fellow peer support worker, Anna. And he uses his experiences to help others. Helping others 
helps Wayne too. I'll always, until the day I die, I'll always remember what I call my first peer support moment. Um, me and a colleague who I work with, Anna, I think we've been on the ward about two weeks. Um, and one of the patients asked me if I could get him his um, deodorant spray because they're not allowed to keep it in the room because they can set the fire alarms off with it. And as he was having his spray, he went, I love seeing you and Anna on the ward. And I went, oh, thanks, mate. I went, that means a lot, that. And he said, because you show me I can get better and I can be in work. And I just thought, brilliant, that's what we're here for. I think the one thing, and the very hardest thing, is to understand that a lot of the thoughts in your head are symptoms. They're not reality. So, for instance, in my head, I I had the idea that absolutely everything in my life was going to get worse. I was going to definitely be dead by the age of 25. Um, there was going to be absolutely nothing at all, no glimmer of light, nothing positive um, could happen. And I'm so glad that I held on because the sheer act of holding on, however painful it is, eventually shifts things. For one thing bigger than depression, bigger than anxiety, bigger than all of us, is time. The programme was presented by the author Matt Haig and it was produced in Edinburgh by Victoria MacArthur. If you're feeling emotionally distressed and would like details of organisations which offer advice and support, do go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash action line or you can call free of charge at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 066 066. That's 0800 066 066.